My name is Jonathan Blanks. I'm a research associate in the Project on Criminal Justice. And it is my great pleasure to uh, host today this forum for this wonderful book, The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist. Um, its authors, Radley Balco, is a Cato alum and an alum of Reason Magazine. Uh, he's an, currently an opinion journalist for the Washington Post, an investigative reporter. Uh, he is the author of the acclaimed book, Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces. Uh, his co-author is Tucker Carrington. He's the director of the George C. Cochran Innocence Project at the University of Mississippi School of Law. He was a criminal defense lawyer here in DC, and so I'm happy to welcome them both back here today. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Don't recognize this place anymore. <laughs> no, we've made a lot of changes. Um, so, oh, for those uh, watching uh, on the internet, uh, you can follow the conversation along on Twitter using the hashtag CatoCJ. Um, just as a little bit of a trigger warning, we are going to talk about uh, some pretty heinous crimes today, um, and that it's just absolutely important that we get to the story of these great injustices uh, that happened in Mississippi, but I think also can happen all over the country. So in 1990, uh, a, a young girl named Courtney Smith was abducted and taken from her home. Uh, she was raped and she was murdered. Uh, two years later, Christine Jackson uh, was also abducted from her home and was raped and murdered. These girls were um, under five years old each. And the, the same man committed both crimes. Unfortunately, he was not prosecuted for these crimes, and two other men, LaVon Brooks and Kennedy Brewer, had been convicted of each of these murders. Um, the story that led to their wrongful convictions is a complicated, convoluted, and absolutely astonishing one when you consider the amount of injustice that went into the system that was built into the system for a very long time. And we are very, want to much, very much want to bring the authors to, in to talk about how that happened and how the policy s sort of like developed. So first of all, how did you each get involved in these stories? Uh, so I first learned about the problems with the death, inves death, death investigation system in Mississippi uh, about 2006. I was looking into a um, drug raid that had happened in South Mississippi. Uh, a guy named Corey May, uh, it was a middle of the night raid, police broke in, uh, appeared to have raided the wrong house by mistake and he shot and killed one of the police officers. Uh, he was tried and convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. Um, there was no real reason to think that he knew they were police officers. He wasn't a, a drug dealer. He smoked uh, recreational pot on occasion. Uh, but the guy who lived next to him in this duplex who he didn't know uh, was a drug dealer, had charges pending against him. Uh, Corey basically said he woke up in the middle of the night with his 18-month-old daughter and thought, you know, they, men were breaking into his home to do him harm, and he shot and killed one, and then uh, when they announced their police, he surrendered, you know, with bullets still left in the gun. Uh, and his case really boiled down to, uh, his, his trial boiled down to whether or not the jury believed him. So his credibility was, was crucial. Uh, and he claimed that as they started trying to break down the door, he, lay, he was laying on the floor uh, in fear and fired up from the floor. Um, the medical examiner, who happened to be Stephen Hain, uh, the cadaver king, um, testified in the case that the trajectory of the bullet in the body was going down. Therefore, uh, Corey must have been laying in wait and not sort of firing up from the floor uh, for, in fear. Uh, and that had a pretty profound effect on the jury, at least uh, I, you would think it would, because it, it basically called his credibility into question. And here was this sort of important, science sounding doctor claiming that it, it didn't happen the way Corey said it did. Um, but I started talking to other medical examiners, and they said, well, that's not really true. The a bullet's trajectory can be uh, altered based on a lot of different factors, including the position of the person who's, who's hit with the bullet. So if the person is sort of crouching, uh, the bullet can actually be going up, uh, but be, when you straighten out the body, it can actually take a downward trajectory. And in fact, there was another bullet from the gun that they found in the house in the door frame, which was going up. Um, and so if you had a fi you have a fixed, uh, you know, a, a fixed, uh, uh, a stationary object and the bullets going up uh, versus a human being, which there are all sorts of factors that could affect the trajectory. And, and this is all stuff, stuff that should have come out of trial. This is something a good medical examiner would have said if the prosecutor tried to say, well, Dr. Hain, if the bullet trajectory was going, you know, 
uh, upward, then it couldn't, or downward, it couldn't have happened the way that uh, Corey May said it did, right? And a good medical examiner would say, well, that's not exactly true. There are other variables that come into play here. And Hain didn't say any of that. He kind of let the prosecutor run with it. Um, and so, I, uh, as a journalist, I found that if you find one example of that kind of behavior, it's probably not the only one, uh, the only time it's happened. So I started calling other defense attorneys, and uh, they all had stories about Dr. Hain. And so then I started calling other medical examiners around the South. Uh, and it was kind of amazing. I mean, I, I wouldn't even have to finish my question. I would say, I'm a journalist looking into a questionable medical examiner, and they would say, oh, you're talking about Stephen Hain in Mississippi, right? Um, and so they all sort of knew this guy, and yet nobody had really done anything about it. And he had done, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of autopsies and testified thousands of times. And, uh, and so it's, you know, as a journalist, I was... Um, well, I want to say, <laughs> to preface this, as a human being, I was outraged. Uh, as a journalist, I was kind of salivating uh, because this was, it was becoming clearer and clearer that this was a pretty huge story. Uh, so that's really sort of how I, I first got involved. I, uh, I, as you mentioned, I was a public defender here in D.C. for about a dozen years. I had moved down to Mississippi with my family in the late summer of 2007. And um, the Innocence Project in New York, specifically Peter Neufeld, who's the co-founder, and Vanessa Potkin is his terrific staff attorney. They have been working on these two cases for years, three or four or five years before, and, and with, along with a number of other lawyers, before I got there. The exonerations uh, of these two gentlemen happened in, in early 2008, and the Innocence Project lawyers were generous enough to sort of give me entree into the case. I, we, my office helped represent LeVon Brooks. So um, I, I just sort of serendipitously got involved uh, in the cases in that way, but um, you know, as the book recounts, Dr. Hain and Dr. West had been involved in many, many other cases in Mississippi throughout the years, and so, you know, for better or for worse, my office, we, we, we litigate all kinds of cases, but we have this sort of cottage industry in, um, in this pr particular forensic discipline, thanks to you know, the Innocence Project in these two cases, that's how I got involved. So being a, being a think tank and a policy shop, we have to talk about the policy before we get into the, the meat of the cases. But I'm just trying to th think of, you know, it, you wrote in the book that there's a difference between forensics and science. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Um, well, forensics, uh, uh, yeah, they're not just different. I mean, they're, they're, they're completely separated. So forensics, uh, forensics are fields of, of expertise that were developed uh, with one purpose in mind, which is to help police and prosecutors uh, solve crimes and win convictions. Um, most fields of forensics were developed not in scientific laboratories, but uh, in police departments and by law enforcement uh, uh, personnel. And so most fields of forensics, at least until recently, were never subject to uh, scientific principles like blind, double-blind testing and peer review and uh, uh, competency tests for the people conducting the analysis. Uh, and uh, law and science have long had this kind of uh, uh, budding of heads. Uh, um, the, the scientific community has tended to sort of uh, steer clear of the legal community. And uh, we get into a little bit of that history in the book, but a big part of the reason is they're just two different, very different ways of looking at the world. Um, science is uh, about uh, sort of the uh, collective uh, accumulation of knowledge. Um, and it's about uh, constantly, it's what we know, what science knows is constantly changing and they're con continually adding to the body of knowledge. Whereas the legal community tends to look to the past for guidance. Uh, we look at precedent, we look at controlling case law. Um, science is always evolving, the legal community is al almost constantly striving not to evolve. Well, maybe that may be putting it a little bit too strongly. If Thanks, you're, if you're, Yeah, exactly. For lawyers may take offense to part of that. But, but particularly with the, within these fields, I think that that, 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 uh, that difference between the two becomes really striking uh, and noticeable. And so when DNA testing came along in the 90s, which did come from the scientific community, it was, it was uh, developed separately, and, but then had this, this unique application uh, to criminal law, uh, it exposed forensics as, as being not nearly as certain and foolproof as we thought it was. Uh, and since then, the scientific community has come around and started uh, trying to check and verify these various fields of forensics. And what they found is that uh, there are huge problems uh, in forensics that the FBI just recently, uh, a few years ago, admitted that its hair fiber analysts uh, had overstated the certainty of their findings in almost every case that they had testified in. This is thousands of cases at the federal level. Uh, not only that, they had trained 
uh, hundreds more analysts at the state and local level who had also used these same methods. That's just one subspecialty of forensics. That's hair fiber analysis. Um, but all the sort of pattern matching fields of, of forensics, they're all just sort of guesswork. They're all, uh, it's very subjective. It's sort of just eyeballing two things, whether it's tire tread patterns or uh, even fingerprints, although fingerprints are a little better, uh, or bite marks and just saying, yeah, those look alike or no, those don't look alike. Uh, and there's no margin for error. There's just no science behind it at all. And yet it's been presented to juries sort of with the, the gloss and veneer of science. Uh, and this is a huge problem and, and the courts really have not found a way to kind of come to terms with uh, really decades of, of looking at this all wrong. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, I think in the common parlance, people who watch all the shows like CSI and all that, you hear the words coroner and medical examiner, and we sort of think of them as the same thing. But in Mississippi, well, around the country, but particularly in Mississippi, they were not. And I was wondering if you could explain the difference and why it was important to these cases. Sure. Um, there's a, Radley and I at least think there's, there's this really interesting chapter in the, in the <laughs> book. I think it's chapter three. Yeah. Um, where we go into the, the history of, of the, the, the office of the coroner. Um, thanks to our editor, it's about one quarter as long as the original draft. But I do think it's interesting in that. Um, but I'll, I'll skip a lot of it to say that when... It, when We're policy folks here. Go well, <laughs> even so. Um, <laughs> um, when when the, the coroner system, which was a sort of by and large a European model, was imported to the United States, it, it, it had a certain um, appeal, a legitimate appeal in, in large part, and I'm oversimplifying. Um, there were large swaths of the country which were sparsely populated. Um, they weren't big metropolitan areas. And you had to have some sort of uh, a way uh, for there to be death investigation. And so the coroner system uh, ended up being that. And um, coroners would, they're typically uh, you know, quote unquote, the first person to arrive at a death. Um, and, and, and they determine whether uh, the death is suspicious, uh, in which case an autopsy may be ordered or not, in which case a death by natural causes and there would be no autopsy. Um, Mississippi, like some other states, but maybe uh, unique in a way, Mississippi elects everybody to every position. Um, and so the coroner in Mississippi is, a, is an elected position. Um, it's, it's, it's very localized. You know, I think, I, I, I don't know, but I think, you know, the, 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 the general budget for a coroner race is probably in the $5,000. Uh, you know, it's, it's not large. Nonetheless, though, as you might imagine, um, the coroner can uh, wield significant amounts of power as he or she determines whether this death is one that um, needs to be investigated. If, if it is um, a death that needs an autopsy, that is when a medical professional, the medical examiner or assistant medical examiner, comes in to perform an autopsy. Um, and in most states, um, not Mississippi for a period of years that we recount in the book, most states have a medical examiner office, sometimes more than one, depending on the size of the state and how many sort of areas of population they may have, the state may have. Um, and that office is populated by a chief medical examiner and assistant medical examiners, where all the autopsies are performed. It's a state public health function. Uh, and all those, all those doctors are doctors, um, and they're certified and licensed to do autopsies. I skipped over one part, which is in, in, in Mississippi and in most states, the qualification for coroner is minimal. Uh, Mississippi, I think, requires um, a high school education um, or equivalent, consistent with the Mississippi Constitution. The mic is caught on in your sweater. So. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. um, I, won't, I won't gesture as much. <laughs> um, in Mississippi, the Constitution requires, as it does for, for, for other positions, that you not um, disclaim a, a belief in a higher being. So those two things uh, you know, differ considerably from a medical doctor who would be the ME doing the autopsies. Yeah, my, my very North, uh, North Carolina, their qualification for coroner was you have to reject atheism and have never participated in a duel. Um, so the, it's, it's people think the coroner and a medical examiner are the same. Usually the coroner is the, the local funeral director or the owner of the local funeral home because they, for them it's actually a lucrative position because they get first crack at the family's funeral services and embalming services. But for most people, it's a part-time, really low-paying position that doesn't, 
uh, it's not really worth the trouble. Uh, in fact, in Mississippi, up until what the eight, mid 80s, early 90s, uh, the coroner had two jobs. One was to oversee all death investigations, and the second job was to round up any stray livestock in the county. Um, so there's a great interview of the coroner in, in the in the 80s where he says, you know, you get a call at 3 a.m. and you don't know if it's a dead body or if there's some sheep that you have to go pick up. Um, so it was kind of a catch-all position for a long time. Uh, and it, as we get closer to the story, we, we, when you start thinking of, I mean, kind of go with the stereotype, you think of Mississippi and injustice, you think of, you know, a racist cop that's framing someone for a murder or something along those lines, yet here we have careerists and opportunists, but there isn't this sort of and, and certainly, you don't come away from this thinking Michael West and Stephen Hayne are great guys, but there isn't this sort of like evil we're out to get this person over here, uh, well, until you get to the prosecutor. But what can you talk about how this sort of was a culmination of an entire system that is basically not rigged for truth? Yeah, so we talk, we, we get into the, the history of the coroner system itself in, in Mississippi uh, and in the South and actually all over the country. Um, and we talk about the term uh, structural racism in the book, uh, and I think that's a very misunderstood term. Uh, people think when you say that an institution is structurally racist that you're saying that everybody who works in that institution is racist, and it's actually just the opposite. Uh, what it means is that the, the, the architecture of that system uh, is, is that it was created in a way uh, or, or with a very specific purpose in mind. And so the death investigation system in Mississippi, for example, was basically created and honed and evolved uh, during the Jim Crow era. And the purpose of the death investigation system was uh, to sweep uh, lynchings and racial violence uh, under the rug. I mean, that's, that's what the coroner system did in Mississippi for the better part of, uh, of uh, you know, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and so we get into this in the book, there's this magical phrase that coroners would use over and over again in lynchings called at the hands of persons unknown. Uh, and if you said that, it was this magical phrase you could do that would just sort of end the investigation because the coroner's jury was basically saying, we don't know who did this and there's no way to find out, therefore we're just going to end this investigation. Um, a lot of times, you know, there was a photo of the lynching on the front page of the newspaper, you know, with easily identifiable people. But the coroner system was a way to kind of uh, preserve the institution of lynching uh, and give it this kind of quasi-legal uh, imprimatur, I guess uh, you could say. Now, that's the system that sort of gets inherited in the 80s and 90s when Hain and West come into play down there. And I don't think, you know, the system today, I mean, I, there, I'm not going to say there's no racism in Mississippi anymore, but certainly it's not uh, the way it used to be, and I don't think that most of the players in the system are explicitly racist. And I certainly don't think Hain and West are. I think they're opportunist, I think, uh, and this system, so the system, you know, the architecture of the system was to sort of benefit or, or to be sort of, um, uh, what's the word, to serve people in power, serve prosecutors, serve sheriffs, serve, serve police uh, chiefs. Uh, and during the Jim Crow era, you know, they wanted that for a very specific, they, they wanted to be served in a very specific way for a very specific person, uh, a purpose. Uh, by the 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, it was more about sort of confirming the hunches of police, of who they thought did this, and helping them close cases and solve crimes, or in some cases, actually uh, helping them not have to investigate cases. Uh, there are examples of sort of poor people who, uh, uh, you know, are deemed uh, insignificant, uh, who were clearly murdered, uh, and were determined to have died of, you know, natural causes or suicide, uh, and that you know, that determination saves the prosecutor or the sheriff the trouble of having to investigate the case. Um, you know, cases where a, a perfectly healthy black kid dies in the back of a police car and is determined it was a heart attack or a stroke. Um, that, again, is a case where the, the system sort of serves whoever's in power. It doesn't have to necessarily be a, a explicitly racist, uh, the, peop the people making the decision. Uh, so, yeah, the, uh, you know, we, we don't, in the book, we go out of the way to say there's no evidence that Stephen Hayne or Michael West are sort of openly bigoted or that this was the racial animus motivated the work. I think they just, it was, I think it was gr partially greed, but I also think they legitimately probably thought they were doing a service, uh, as warped and twisted as that service may have been. I, I just add one of the things I've always found fascinating about these two cases is that um, after the exonerations, I, they, they were both, they are both terrific. Um, individuals with these compelling stories. I guess I should say, um, most unfortunately, um, 
Lavon Brooks, who I know some people in the audience um, had met, had dinner with even, um, was diagnosed with stomach cancer about um, four or five years ago. Um, and he did quite well for a period of time. And then he passed away about five weeks ago. He was a terrific, just terrific person. And not only because he had a compelling story and he was uh, not bitter and he was generous and funny, he was just a charismatic person um, who was robbed of a decade, over a decade and a half of his life, and he didn't get to see the book published. And one of the reasons we wanted to write the book because we felt like this story ought to be memorialized for him and for his, uh, for Kennedy Brewer. Um, but anyhow, I digress. The, the, um, um, one of the things that was fascinating to me was that the book, or at least part of it, upends these sort of conventional narratives that a lot of us non-Mississippians, including myself, would attribute to Mississippi, which is, oh, this must be you know, yet another um, uh, example of uh, some you know, bigoted Mississippi story. But the fact of the matter was that um, almost all of the law enforcement uh, in both these cases were comprised of African-American sheriffs and police chiefs and so forth. Um, Kennedy Brewer had two attorneys, one of whom was African-American. Um, there were African-American jurors, which I don't need to tell, I don't think, this audience. That in itself in Noxaby County was a tremendous journey over a period of about four and five, four and five decades just to get on to a pettit jury in a criminal trial. Um, and yet the results uh, in these two cases were arguably granted, you know, they weren't taken out and hung from a tree in the middle of the night. Um, but in some ways it was more insidious they were both convicted. Kennedy Brewer was sentenced to death within the system, within the courthouse, um, with the participation of black folks and white folks. And there was no, there was no sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, racial, at least overt racial bigotry in any of the trials. And yet, as Radley says, you know, we end up at the end of the road, not too far away from what we got in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Right, and so, Let's talk about Levon's story first, because it happened, f it, and, and uh, to be fair, like it's Levon and Courtney Smith's story as well. Um, it, it, it just actually, can you just take it from there? Just like what what exactly happened, and ha what was the police response to the case? You can go well, first. Um, um, I'll try to I'll try to make this concise. Um, the, 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 the little girl, um, Courtney, was put to bed with her sisters one evening. And um, because of the sort of family dynamics, people working and so forth, and there were multiple caretakers, she wasn't, uh, n you know, f noticed that she was actually missing, not there, until um, late the next, sort of later the next evening. Um, uh, and when she was, everybody panicked, and there was a search for her, she was ultimately found the following morning floating in, in a pond, um, having been um, um, murdered, it was clear. Um, sort of immediately, um, and sexually assaulted pro probably, it looked like she was naked. Um, all the males sort of within the, the um, house, you know, who'd sort of had access to the house were immediately made suspects. And almost all of them were detained. Um, as being suspects just because they were male. Um, the Courtney's... I, uh, just ahead. jump in, because I think this goes back to your, your previous question, which is, you know, the, the lead investigator was a black uh, deputy uh, in this case, and he approached this case basically by arresting every man with, who had any uh, sort of geographic access to the little girl that night. Uh, so you know, you have a black deputy running the investigation and the result of this is every black male in the vicinity basically gets arrested and put in jail. Um, and, you know, his, his approach was, you just arrest them all and put them all in jail and then wait for the truth to come out. Um, and so again, this is a system where, you know, you, you African-Americans are participating in this system and it's still kind of the same result as it would have been if, you know, if, it, if this had been in the, the 50s or 60s, uh, unfortunately. Truth did come out, it just took 20 years. Yeah, it took 20 years. So. Um, Anyways, um, the, the, the Courtney's slightly older sister, five, was interviewed, um, and her, her interview was very odd. It was sort of contradictory. We go into it in the book, but, but ultimately it led to Mr. Brooks, who, who um, had been a friend of, of the victim's mother. Um, and 
we, we tell this story in the book. I don't want to, I guess, give too much of it away, but it's poignant. Mr. Brooks was, um, he had this terrific job. He, he, as I said, he was super charismatic. He had this job at a, at a nightclub. He was sort of um, a jack of all trades. He'd show up and help get the place open. Then he took tickets at the door. He was sort of a semi-bouncer during the night. Um, and then it, when, the, when the bar shut down, dance club shut down, he was a great cook. Um, he would cook fried fish, and, and then he would go home at like 3 or 4 in the morning. Um, and that's where he was all that night. He had an alibi like nobody else I've ever seen. He had like 500 alibi witnesses. Um, but um, once he had been sort of identified as, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, the suspect, um, Dr. West was brought in. Marks, supposedly bite marks, had been found on, on Courtney's body. And Dr. West matched the bite marks to uh, Mr. Brooks. Uh, there's this, as I said, poignant moment um, where LaVon was out actually the next Saturday or maybe the Saturday after at this nightclub doing his job and the, and the police had been there looking for him. And he, he, he was wondering why and he told his coworkers, let me just run back down to Macon. Give me a minute. I'm going to go by the sheriff's department and straighten this whole thing out. Um, and so he drove down and they arrested him and that was the, he never came back. Um, and he was, he was locked up for the next um, 16 years based on the bite mark identification. Um, fast forward two years, similar situation, Kennedy Brewer and Christine Jackson. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell that one. So this was, uh, it's about, a, what, a mile and a half away? It's, yeah, as the crow flies. Back yeah, back. so, you know, it's the same county. Uh, this kind of crime is extremely rare. Uh, and you've got uh, a couple years later, a mile and a half away, Almost identical crime. Girl about the same age is abducted from her home in the night, uh, raped uh, and murdered. Uh, in this case, again, uh, for whatever reason, local authorities focused on the uh, a, a, a sort of love interest of the mother of the girl. In this case, it was Kenny Brewer who lived with uh, the mother. And uh, the one thing that was a little bit different about this case is the two, uh, the Brewer and the mother immediately sort of turn on one another, probably because they each knew that they didn't do it uh, and suspected the other one had something to do with it. And the prosecutor ends up kind of playing them off of one another and eventually uh, focuses on Brewer. Uh, by the way, in the Brooks case, the mother of the little girl actually did not think that LaVon did it, in fact testified for him at his trial uh, and for that so suffered the wrath of the prosecutor. Um, but the, the Kenny Brewer case, um, uh, this is Christine Jackson, this little girl's name. Uh, they find her, um, I think it was, what, two days later, um, and they, again in a, in a pool or a, a pond. Um, and again, they focus on, on Kennedy. Uh, and in both cases, the guy who actually committed the crimes was, was a suspect early on. Uh, in the first case, Michael West, the uh, you know the forensic wizard, actually cleared uh, Justin Albert Johnson, the guy who actually committed and uh, did his bite mark analysis, and, and cleared Johnson, excluded him. Uh, in this, in the second case, uh, Johnson was an early suspect, but again, they immediately sort of went to Brewer, uh, and uh, in, in this case, uh, Brewer you know maintained his innocence, and the uh, the local prosecutor said, well, if you're really innocent, there's one way that you can prove your innocence, and that's you can go down to Michael West in Hattiesburg. And have him take a dental mold, and uh, you know if you're innocent, he'll clear you. Uh, but of course, by then uh, he was already the chief suspect. And what West basically did wasn't so much uh, you know an independent forensic analysis as he just sort of uh, confirmed whatever hunch uh, the local law enforcement officials had, and their hunch was Kennedy that Kennedy had done it. Um, so Kennedy is uh, charged. He's uh, later uh, tried uh, and convicted, and Levon was sentenced to life in prison. Uh, Kennedy was actually sentenced to death. Um, he, uh, both were sentenced in the 90s. Uh, we, if you remember back to the context of the 90s is uh, the crime rate is soaring. Politicians are kind of outdoing one another to see who can be tougher on crime. Uh, the governor of Mississippi at the time uh, pro had proclaimed mo on multiple occasions that his goal was to make Mississippi the capital of capital punishment. Uh, there were all sorts of proposals from the legislature to limit appeals. In fact, in one case, they, a couple of legislators, or actually the governor, I think, even said he wanted uh, anybody who was sentenced to death, he wanted them basically executed within a year of their conviction, um, which of course means Kennedy Brewer would, would certainly be dead if that law had passed uh, and passed the courts. Uh, the, even the paper, the Clarion Ledger, uh, 
ran, I think we counted uh, over 35 editorials uh, in the 1990s where they were either calling for speedier executions or calling for executions of particular people. Uh, and this is kind of the climate that these guys were dealing with. Um, uh, and so Brewer, um, he uh, gets sentenced to death. Uh, he's in prison. He gets a series of really bad court-appointed attorneys. Uh, and uh, there are these very poignant moments, I think, in the book where he's, he's writing letters to his attorneys and just sort of pleading for, for someone, uh, you know, anyone to hear him. At one point, he even just asks his attorney merely just for some money so he can buy a typewriter so that he can write, you know, the letters that his attorney is failing to write on his behalf. Um, and, uh, you know, Kennedy was, was exonerated or excluded, I guess, with, by DNA testing in 2000, I think it was. Um, and, you know, they did DNA testing. It said it was, it, that this isn't the person who left the, the sperm cells in the victim. Uh, and yet the prosecutor continued uh, to keep him in prison on the theory that, uh, okay, well, maybe he didn't rape the little girl, but, he must, but we have this compelling bite mark evidence, so he must have held her down and bit her while someone else raped her. Uh, and so he kept Kennedy in prison for another uh, seven years uh, based on that theory, uh, relying solely uh, basically on the uh, expertise of Michael West, who uh, I'm sure we'll discuss more. Yeah, I was just about to go there. So now we know that they're, the, the bar for making a coroner isn't that high, but these guys weren't just guys off the street. They were, they were educated. They were certified in in a sense. And so can you talk about their history and how they like became the sort of, well, the cadaver king and the country dentist? How did they become where they were in the uh, state system? I'll take one, I'll take the other. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, Dr. West, who was the forensic odontologist. He, he um, was a clinical dentist in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, in southern Mississippi. He had been in the Air Force and had gotten, um, uh, been, been, been um, tapped to be and then got interested in um, identifying um, um, people who had died in plane accidents by matching up their dental records. Um, and from there, um, after he got out of the Air Force, came back and got interested. He's, he's, a, very, he's a smart person. Um, uh, but he got interested in forensic odontology, specifically this sort of sub-discipline of matching marks, typically on victims, to suspects' dentitions. Um, and he made quite a name for himself. He's a sort of flamboyant, um, in, in, a, in a sort of uh, uh, provincial Mississippi way, flamboyant um, uh, witness. He's a, he's a big personality. Um, and his, his reputation, both as a forensic odontologist, as someone who was, had this sort of preternatural ability to match bite marks um, uh, from suspects um, to victims and vice versa, grew as did his uh, uh, forensic abilities in other areas. He became a videotape enhancement expert, a fingernail scratch matching expert. Um, there's a host of other things. Um, and he was in great demand, from what I can tell from, from both transcripts and videos, sort of loved uh, being in a witness chair and, and, and um, testifying. Um, and, and for this period of time, he was a colleague of Dr. Haynes. They worked together. Um, I don't think he ever made terribly much money, but um, he, had a, he had a terrific um, reputation amongst um, that community. And for a period of time there, um, was in great demand in high profile cases. He solved them. Um, so Dr. Hain, um, well, I would disagree a little bit, Tucker. I, th I, think, I think West was very curious. Uh, uh, Smart, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think he's, uh, he was very good at sort of uh, sounding smart and sounding official. And, and, and uh, Hain, I think, was kind of brilliant in a lot of ways. He was also very socially, had a high social IQ. He could sort of read a room and could sort of tell what people wanted from him and could then deliver it. Um, but he was a doctor. Uh, he was certified in uh, clinical pathology, which is sort of the, when you're uh, determining, you know, what disease or you know, bacterial infection killed someone. Um, he took the test for forensic pathology, and that's the, the field where you're doing autopsies to try to determine how a crime was committed or an ne act of negligence. Um, but uh, he took the test for the kind of gold standard certification in that field and failed it. Uh, he would later say that he didn't fail it so much as he deliberately walked out uh, because he was furious uh, because the, he found the questions were insulting to his intelligence. Um, we later found out that the question, one of the questions he would, he would repeatedly cite 
uh, which was, he said, claimed there was this question that asked him to rank colors based on their association with death, which he thought was really dumb and sounds kind of dumb, frankly. Uh, but that, that, that question actually never appeared on the test either. Um, so instead, he was certified by a couple of these other groups that were these sort of fly-by-night um, crazy organizations that emerged in the, in the, the 1990s or thereabout. Uh, that were certification mills. You would send them your resume and, you know, 500 bucks, and they would send you your official certification. And you could then claim in court that you were certified in forensic pathology. Uh, and they had names that sounded like the, the gold standard organization. So Hain, for example, was certified uh, by the American Board of Forensic Pathology. Well, the gold standard is you, in, in that field is you're certified uh, by the American Board of Pathology in forensic pathology. Uh, but, you know, that's a very subtle difference in language, and so for judges and jurors and prosecutors, uh, it kind of sounds all the same. Uh, and even actually when, when defense attorneys would point out that there was a huge difference between these two groups, uh, the judges just didn't really seem to care. Um, uh, the, one of the groups that Hain uh, was certified by is this group called the American College of Forensic Examiners Institute, which is just a lot of uh, official sounding words kind of jammed together. Um, but this group was, was founded by a guy who, uh, a poli sci professor who had been fired for uh, plagiarism uh, and then started a handwriting analysis group that then expanded to what is now one of the largest forensic groups in the country. Um, but they, again, it's not, it's not a rigorous sort of credentialing organization. It's a, it's a group who makes a lot of money by sending people what sounds like an official uh, certification. And so there's a a woman who got her cat certified through this group to kind of prove a point. And there was another uh, journalism student who got certified in forensic medicine just through, it, through the internet uh, with this organization. Uh, my favorite example is the guy who started this guy, Robert O'Block. His first um, director of training that he hires, so the person who's going to oversee all the training in all these different forensic fields, this guy who, um, uh, his highest level of education was high school uh, and who uh, had previously made money uh, by hypnotize, uh, had convinced women that he could hypnotize them into making their breasts grow larger. Um, and even what's even funnier about it is that guy later quit because he thought that O'Block uh, was not a credible person and his organization wasn't <laughs> credible. Um, and this is today is, O'Block actually died last year, but this is today is one of the largest forensic organizations in the country. And in fact, it has celebrity endorsers like Cyril Wecht and uh, Henry Lee and some of these sort of uh, sort of rock stars in the world of forensics, which is just a, kind of a hilarious thought. In itself. <laughs> um, but, the, but this is the group that Hain said in court that had certified him, and it was good enough for the judges and prosecutors and, and in some cases, defense attorneys and certainly the juries. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the failures, one of the institutions that fail, we talk about over and over in the book, are the other professional organizations, kind of the, the reputable ones or the, that are supposed to be kind of policing each other and, and supposed to be on the lookout for people like Hain. And there are lots of examples where people were, were trying to put up red flags about what was going on in Mississippi. Uh, and it was really, uh, it wasn't until uh, 2000, a case in 2007 that um, the courts finally started noticing a little bit. And this was a case where, uh, and I'll just, I'll end my discussion of Hain with this case because it's one of his uh, famous ones. Um, the, this is a case where a 13-year-old uh, kid was being charged as an adult with murder. Uh, and the prosecutor's theory, the, the victim was the, um, his sister's husband who was allegedly abusive. Who knows if he was. But the prosecutor's theory was that the brother and sister had, neither of them had got the guts to commit the murder on their own. So they waited until the husband was asleep. And then the two of them held the gun simultaneously and pulled the trigger together, right? Which, you know, who knows if that happened. Uh, maybe, maybe it did or maybe it didn't. But Hain actually testified in court uh, that he could tell by the bullet wounds that there were two people holding the gun that fired the bullets as opposed to one, which is, of course, absurd, right? There's just no possible way that you can tell that from bullet wounds. Uh, and yet, uh, in that particular case, the defense challenged this and said this was not scientific. Uh, and the judge didn't even give them a hearing said, of course it's scientific, let him, let him go with it. Later, the defense tried to call an expert on, uh, the, the kid had, fall, had confessed and then immediately retracted. Uh, and, you know, he was young, he was away from his parents, he was like an ideal candidate for false confessions. And the defense wanted to put on an expert about false confessions. And the prosecution objected, said, well, this isn't scientific. And the judge held a one-day hearing and determined that experts on false confessions weren't scientifically credible and refused to let this person. So the two hands on the gun theory gets in, the false confessions expert doesn't, the kid gets convicted. Uh, Mississippi Court of Appeals upholds the conviction and it's not until we get to the Mississippi Supreme Court um, 
And even then, actually, the Mississippi Supreme Court initially votes to uphold the conviction. One dissenting justice writes a blistering dissent, calling out all of his colleagues, uh, convinces them to do it to vote again, and on the second vote, they vote to throw out the conviction. Um, and that was really, I think, when things started to to unravel for Hain, because uh, you know that the testimony was so absurd in that case. I think be, people started taking a closer look at what he had said in other cases. And so, but it, what his misconduct was went much further than just going into court, which obviously is a massive problem. But you know, what was his workload like? What was what was he doing on the day-to-day basis? Because not everything he was doing was like these high-profile murder cases. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, so he, yeah, he was doing 1,500 to 2,000 autopsies per year, which uh, the professional organizations say you should do about 250 to 275 at most, 325, and they'll, they won't certify you anymore. Uh, Hain was doing 1,500 to 2,000 while testifying in court all over the state three to five times per week and holding down two full-time jobs at local uh, medical facilities. Uh, he was also doing private autopsies. He was doing autopsies in Louisiana for a lot of his career. Um, and had a particularly sort of ghoulish spin on all of this. Because he had these two full-time jobs, uh, he did most of his autopsies at night uh, at, at this, mor- this private morgue. Uh, so he'd do them from about five or six in the evening till two or three in the morning. And if you do the math, they're doing seven, eight, nine autopsies at once uh, over the course of the night. Um, one of my favorite quotes that did not make it in the book for legal reasons um, is uh, there's a former director of the state crime lab who I interviewed very early on when I was looking into all this, and he told me that he, was, he had been hired from out of state to kind of come in and, and clean up the, uh, the, the crime lab. And uh, he said the first time he went and visited Haynes' practice, for lack of a better term, uh, he said he was just floored because he walked in and there were like seven or eight bodies open, and they were smoking cigars as they were doing these autopsies going from body to body. Uh, and at one point, they decided they were hungry, and so they sent out for pork sandwiches. And uh, I, I remember the quote almost verbatim that he gave me, which is that he said, I, said I, I, I watched in disbelief as they smoked cigars and ate pork sandwiches while somebody ran a bone saw on the skull of a crack prostitute. Now, that's significant because have you ever seen a, I, uh, I've actually seen autopsies be done as part of my work, and when you run a bone saw, there's a little vapor that goes up in the air. Um, those are chips of bone. Uh, and it goes up in the air and then it comes back down. So if you're you know, eating a sandwich in that environment, I'll, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Um, but it wasn't the most sort of hygienic uh, uh, environment, I guess, and certainly not one for you know, good sort of scientific uh, analysis of what they were finding. Um, I, want, I want to go back to your last uh, question. Well, the last comment you were making, you were talking about the judges. How like how had how did they drop the ball throughout this? Because I mean, it seems to be failure at every level. Where 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 did the judges fall in? Well, I do think I mean your 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 comment is a good one. It was a failure at at every level, and and um, not that you were doing this, but I, to the extent that we're going to focus on judges, judges according to case law, this is oversimplifying it, but are supposed to be gatekeepers um, according to Dalbert in the sort of trilogy of cases for this type of of um, um, professional expert um, evidence. The, the problem is um, there are a host of issues. Um, one is that, and these are all sort of systemic um, institutional problems. I think in the cases that I've looked at, including these, um, the attorneys on either side weren't doing their jobs, which is to say they weren't, they weren't giving um, uh, material um, uh, on behalf of either their client or the state um, to, a, to the judges so that the judges could make informed decisions about the admissibility of this type of evidence. That was one problem. The other problem is that um, the way I would, I would sort of explain it is that judges typically are fairly risk averse. And when you're confronted with a question about admissibility in a particular discipline, um, Rather than bearing down um, with rigor on the type of opinion that's being offered in the bases for it on a case-by-case analysis, um, what judges typically do, both trial court judges and appellate judges, is they will look backwards at precedent, at other jurisdictions, and whether other jurisdictions have admitted or not this type of evidence. The problem is sort of twofold there. One is that that has limited utility because the precedential value um, 
is only as good as the hearing that was held in that particular case to determine admissibility. And you know, you can see this pattern developing, and, and I've, we've looked at this not so much in the book, but um, in a law review article that I wrote with a colleague at the Innocence Project, we got transcripts um, that went back to these cases. And there was no hearing. There wasn't anything approaching for those lawyers out there, a rigorous Daubert hearing. And so what the precedential value is, is at best minimum. Um, you're sort of reaffirming um, bad analysis after bad analysis. There's sort of this, in the book we call it this echo chamber effect. Um, and so you're building up um, for the lawyers out there, a long string site of cases that appear on their face to endorse the admissibility of a particular discipline, but there is no there there. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll end by answering your, your question this way. If you were, say, a law clerk today, today right now, um, for a judge, and the judge said, hey, I need you to go uh, find out whether we got this trial coming up and there's an expert in forensic odontology. I need you to go look and see whether or not forensic odontology is a legitimate discipline and then come back and tell me in what jurisdiction it's been admitted. You know, you get on, as the clerk, if you get on Westlaw or Lexis and look it up, you will find jurisdiction after jurisdiction that has admitted this discipline. And if the judge says, well, let me, let me, let's, let's go out on a limb. What has Mississippi done? Um, and the clerk goes back and, and looks at Mississippi, the two leading cases to this day about the admissibility of bite mark evidence are LeVon Brooks and Kennedy Brewer. The cases are there. You can, and they've been cited as authoritative precedent. What the cases don't say um, is that those two gentlemen were later exonerated and that the bite mark evidence was nonsense. Um, so in that way, both, I think, judges have been derelict. They've been victimized is probably too strong of a word, but they've been lulled into a false sense of security based on, you know, the, the, the usefulness of presidential value. Do you think the fact that they were all elected had anything to do with that? Um, yes, but yes, generally. But I think, um, let me just, let me answer your question this way with respect to, we, we're still litigating. In fact, I filed a brief um, just on Tuesday, you know, in a bite, death penalty bite mark case in Mississippi with Dr. West, where essentially the only evidence of guilt is, is the bite marks. Um, in that case, that case started, commenced two weeks after another death case in the same courtroom where Dr. West had been a, um, a, a witness and had matched the dentition to a bologna sandwich. Um, and in that same district, I guess four or five years before, Brooks and Brewer had been convicted. Um, so you had Brooks sentenced to life, Brewer sentenced to death. You had uh, this other individual sentenced uh, to life. And then you had this current, this current case. I mean, it's, it's a lot to ask, not only of an elected judge, but put, put the election to the side of a judge who has sat in on and ruled on the admissibility of this discipline with this very same expert. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine a scenario where a judge is gonna say, you know what, not today. Not, it's not admissible anymore because what that judge is doing simultaneously is saying, I think we need to revisit the case where there was a conviction two weeks ago and we need to revisit the death uh, the death verdict for Kennedy Brewer's case, and we need to revisit. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I think um, I think the judges have been bad at this, whether they're elected or appointed. I mean, the federal courts that oversee Mississippi have been haven't been much better than the state courts. However, um, I do think that the election of judges creates its own problems. Um, and this is always a, an interesting question: in the criminal justice system, sort of how much democracy do we want, right? Um, uh, and I'd love to see some academic studies on sort of sheriffs versus police chiefs, which I think is kind of fascinating. But um, in terms of judges, we talk about this a little bit in the book. So there's one judge in the 90s, uh, one lonely judge, who Supreme Court justice, who actually did call West into question and said, what are we doing with this guy? Like, we, you know, we shouldn't, this is crazy. Like, we shouldn't be admitting this guy uh, as an, or certifying him as an expert. Um, and he had his own problems. He got pulled over for a couple DWIs, uh, but he... Uh, he being the judge. The judge, yes. But he, um, 
he was targeted when he ran for re-election. He was targeted with a bunch of pretty nasty uh, attack ads who basically accused him of, uh, you know, siding with uh, child rapists and child killers. And the uh, the case that the ad mentions over and over again, it was very effective. He, he he may have lost anyway because of the other stuff, but he was he was trounced in the election. In fact, I think he came, came in third even maybe. Um, the the, the case that, that the attack ad references over and over again was the case of LeVon Brooks, um, a case where the guy was actually innocent. Uh, and then there was another case, uh, there's a case, Jeffrey Havard, uh, in, that partic- in that case, this is a, a Hain testif- it was a Hain case, and he testified that uh, Havard had uh, shook, shaken the baby to death using this theory called shaken baby syndrome, which has also since been called into question, uh, and f- claimed to have found evidence of sexual abuse to that now he disclaims both of those. He says shaken baby syndrome, he, 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 he accepts that the scientific consensus has changed, and he weirdly claims he never uh, found sexual abuse, which uh, doesn't really jive with the transcripts of the time. However, um, that particular case, Havard is still on death row in Mississippi. Uh, he does have a, a hearing coming up where they're going to you know, consider giving him a new trial. But in that case also, there was one judge over the years who uh, called out Hain repeatedly, uh, and who, in the Havard case, um, you know, called for Havard's conviction to be thrown out. And he was attacked with attack ads when he ran for re-election as well. Uh, and the case that they cite, where they said, you know, Judge Diaz sided with a convicted child killer and rapist, uh, it was the Jeffrey Havard case. Um, and the really interesting thing I found when we were researching and reporting this book is that the among the groups that repeatedly go after these justices for being so-called soft on crime and who turned out to actually have been right uh, is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, which I always found sort of strange. Which is what is, you know, what does being soft on crime have to do with commerce? And it turns out it was, a, it was sort of a uh, an assumption that if a justice, if a, if a judge is um, soft on crime, they're also going to be sort of anti-business. And it's actually, it turns out in Mississippi, that's not true. Um, the, the Supreme Court is much more kind of, I don't know, nuanced, or the, the politics align in a little bit different ways. Um, but I, I, was, I was struck when I found that, like, you know, it was sort of these, one of these uh, pro-business groups that were going after judges for, you know, not uh, siding with, uh, with prosecutors. Uh, but I think it was the Center for American Progress did a study, and they actually found that, um, a direct correlation between the amount of spending on a, on a Supreme, state Supreme Court election uh, and the propensity with which judges would side with prosecutors in the ensuing term. Uh, so the more money that was spent, the less justices were likely to uh, find for uh, defendants uh, in appeal, uh, appellate cases. All right, uh, time has flown by, so I'm gonna open it up for a couple of questions. Um, while we're waiting for the mics, uh, just, uh, identify yourself if you have any affiliations that might be relevant. Uh, please form your question in the form of a question and please keep it very, very brief. Uh, we're still holding on the microphone. Right down here in the front, please. Hi, I'm Garrett Epps from The Atlantic, and uh, I'm uh, having been dialed into this case some years ago. Uh, I would love to know your conclusion at this point about Forrest Allgood, who, who <laughs> is the most enigmatic character in it to me, uh, infuriating. But, um, you know, we haven't talked much about him, and he, yep. he makes a lot of things happen in the book. So you might explain to people who he is and, and talk a little about him. Um, first of all, Garrett, it's very nice to see you um, again. Um, Forrest Allgood, for, for those uh, who, who don't know, was the longtime prosecutor in this district and prosecuted both the, the Brooks and Brewer cases. He is an enigmatic in, individual, um, and uh, this sounds like an excuse, but, but he's still enigmatic to me. Um, he um, is a native Mississippian. He was a, uh, a prosecuting attorney down there for, for uh, two decades or so. But he recently lost. Um, um, and he lost, interestingly, we, we don't get into this uh, in the book, but he lost to a young uh, African-American DA uh, who was also... Uh, defense attorney, right? Um, yes, who's, who's done defense work, who, who ran on a platform that is fairly progressive drug court um, 
locking up a lot fewer people um, than, than during the all good era. Um, I don't know how to frankly answer your question except to say a couple things. One is that, that Mr. Allgood, um, during the years I worked with him, uh, never turned down a request to do DNA testing, um, which is interesting given uh, his predilection for um, aggressive prosecuting. Um, that said, um, there, there's, a, I think, a really interesting part of the book where, um, and this happens with some frequency in Mississippi, which was astonishing to me, having been an attorney here for years. People refer frequently, by people I mean attorneys in Mississippi refer, maybe I should say, not infrequently to the Bible uh, during closing argument as a way to buttress um, um, what they think ought to be the, um, the jury's verdict. And um, this, this, this really is not responsive to your question except collaterally. And that is, um, there, Mr. Allgood would frequently make this argument. It was the same in a, in a number of his cases uh, during the penalty phase of death penalty cases where he would say, um, God created um, vessels which are fit for, not, uh, were fit for, for destruction. Um, in other words, there was this sort of biblical underpinning for a jury to recognize that certain people um, are fit for destruction, and, 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 and in that way, the jury could, could come back with um, uh, a verdict of death. What, I, what is so sort of fascinating to me about that is, A, that it happened. This is not my experience. But B, that... Um, that in these innocence cases, I mean, these, cases, these guys were innocent. Um, it, really, it really calls into question, you know, theology. Um, it's, it's, and, and in that way, I, I think he's a, again, I don't know how to answer your question except to say it's, he's, a, he's sort of a fascinating case study. He, he believes in what he's doing with a capital B. Um, and, and because he would say, you know, there's a sort of, um, religiously ordained aspect um, to what I'm arguing for here, and and that it turns out to have been wrong, or maybe what I should say is there was a religious aspect to it. Um, these guys were ultimately exonerated. Um, I, I think there's all kind. I mean, frankly, my, my answer is after I've gone on this long is I think there are all kinds of lessons that all of us can take from that kind of advocacy, but particularly prosecutors. Um, it's fine to believe in your case, um, but I think it's also fine and, in fact, um, probably a job requirement to be very, very skeptical of your case. Um, and, and in that way, I think uh, he was not. Um, yeah, I agree with Tucker. I'm going to say the same thing he said, except less charitably. Um, uh, there's a really telling interview that Allgood did with a local newspaper toward the end of his career where they asked him about drug crimes. And he had, toward the end of, career, end of his career, he had prosecuted this elderly woman. They found some pot plants in her backyard and it wasn't even clear that she had planted them there or even knew about them, but she did acknowledge they were there. And I think she got, I can't remember what it was, like a 30-year sentence or something. Um, and, you know, they're asking about these cases where he's really thrown the book at people for drug crimes, even when there's no underlying violence or, you know, any other crime. And he says... Basically what he says is, is, and I'm paraphrasing, but that you know, drug crimes are a good way to sort of, um, uh, to, to get the people who you're pretty sure have done other bad things, but you don't have the evidence to, to go after them. And you know, I think that, that, that speaks volumes about kind of the way he approached his job, which was that he, he was a deeply, deeply religious man, as Tucker suggests, um, and that's when you, when you talk to other people in Mississippi about him, that's what they, the first thing they'll say, and it's, they'll say that, that his faith really motivated his work, and I think, um, you know, I don't want to delve too deep into his motivations, but I do think that at some level he sort of felt like, you know, everybody that God put in front of him must have been guilty or, or they wouldn't be in his crosshairs. And so even when there's evidence, like even, again, with Kennedy Brewer, even when the DNA comes back and says, he didn't rape this girl, all good's well, he must have held her down and bitter while somebody else raped her then. Um, and even LeVon Brooks, who uh, all good did apologize to, he still, he, he never apologized to Brewer, um, but even with LeVon, when, when we interviewed him for the book, I interviewed him over email, and, and he's still not even sure LeVon's innocent. Um, and so I think he just has a really hard time sort of, just, he, I, I just don't think he thinks that, 
you know, God would let him convict an innocent person. Um, and I, that, that, that may be sort of uncharitable, but I, that's just what I get from, uh, I don't know, the, the interviews I've seen with him and the one interview I did with him. All right, well, unfortunately, we are out of time. However, uh, let's give them a big round of applause, please. <laughs>